أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد رحمة الله للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبته أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته to everybody hope everybody is doing amazing الحمد لله and staying strong and being healthy. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I wanted to do a short series. Welcome from Knoxville, Tennessee. Beautiful city, mashallah. I wanted to, um, first of all, just sort of lay out what you can expect over the next few weeks. And inshallah ta'ala, by the will of God Almighty, we hope it will be a, a blessed gathering and one that is a benefit uh, by, the, for, by, by the will of Allah. So tonight, what we're going to talk about is the first sort of prerequisite needed to understanding Islam's attitude towards resilience and suffering. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Resilience and suffering. How do we put ourselves in a place to have a framework to understand Islam's attitude or teachings on the idea of resilience and suffering? So tonight, we'll break into that sort of first piece where we'll talk about what is Iman? What is faith and what are the components of faith? Then next week, we'll talk about one component of the foundational pillars of belief in Islam, which is everything that happens in our life, whether good or bad, theodicy. How do we understand theodicy? Theodicy means why do things happen? So next week, we'll get into specifically what C.S. Lewis wrote about is the problem of suffering. What classical scholars talked about was the challenge of pain, the challenge of difficult times. It's very easy to be a committed believer. It's very easy to be com committed when things are going well. But how do we maintain the proper attitude towards existential and internal threats as a Muslim so that we maintain the capacity for resilience? So we will talk about that next week. And then a few weeks after that, uh, through my school, Swiss, which will be free and online for everybody. We'll go through a poem called Al Munfarija. And yeah, these are recorded here, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. And Al Munfarija is a brief poem written by a great scholar, Ibn Nahwi, on how to push in, how to push in to pain and how to push in to crisis and how to keep trauma in front of you instead of behind you. So this will be really three sessions, this this evening and then next week, Wednesday, inshallah. And then a few weeks later, we have our Swiss winter retreat at my school, which will be free uh, for everybody, alhamdulillah. And we'll go through in one day or two days, we'll see the poem of Imam Ibn Nahwi, who's a great, great scholar of Islam, who wrote a poem called The Reliever, which is dedicated solely to the challenge of difficult times. And I say that because there are a lot of messages, especially now with what's going on across the globe, in Palestine, in the Congo, in the Sudan, in Afghanistan, and even here in the United States, these are difficult times to be a faithful person. But Islam, as we will learn, frames difficulty as opportunity. And we will talk about how the true believer what you should take from this course is that the true believer does not come out in submission to difficulties, nor are challenges and traumas an alibi to quit. But the true believer is the one that knows that they are commanded to oppose what Allah has decreed with what Allah has commanded. And that will be what we talk about next week. So whatever is happening in the world is no longer an excuse for me, an alibi to submit to that. My submission is to Allah. I'm not Muslim to the dunya. I'm Muslim to Allah. And so that's where we want to arrive uh, by the end of our discussion next week. And then inshallah ta'ala, we will push through uh, a few weeks later with a poem at the Swiss Winter Retreat, which is online for free at my school, alhamdulillah. And we'll do it here, as well as on the app and the webpage at Swiss, um, on the problem of suffering. So what we want to talk about tonight is faith. 
the idea of faith in Islam. And for those of you who are born Muslim, you're going to hear things that you may never have heard before that I really hope will be like emancipating and liberating and eye-opening. And I encourage people who can to put notes into the comments box, the person who does the best notes, I give them lifetime free subscription to my school. Alhamdulillah, uh, Rabbil Alameen, out of appreciation for you. So we begin, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. First of all, the idea of Iman. Iman is translated as belief. But the word Iman actually is from a word which means to feel secure. And that's very beautiful, that's very powerful, that the word for faith in Islam is from a word which means to feel safe. Because we should be safe with Allah. We should feel safe in our relationship with Allah. If you're an educator, I did my degree, my undergrad in education, you know like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People have to feel secure before they can learn. People have to feel secure before they can have ma'rif of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you, Um Jibreel. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a chapter called Quraysh, he says, وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from fear. It's the same word, amana iman. Amana iman. Right? Security, protection from khawf. So iman is rooted in the idea of feeling safe and secure. And the epistemology of Islamic law or the framework of Islamic law um, the definitions or nomenclature of Islamic law, the majority of, of Sunni, uh, Sunni theologians defined Iman as Tasdiq al-Qalb only. Tasdiq al-Qalb, the affirmation of the heart. The affirmation of the heart. Because the outcome, and I don't want to make this too complicated for you, but the outcome of proper cognition is either usaddiq or ukadhib. I affirm something or I deny something. And in order for me to strengthen my ability to affirm something, I have to know it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends ayat. He sends signs to us through his book, through the world that we live in, and even in ourselves. As he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْسِرُونَ In yourself are signs. And that's why in the Qur'an we are commanded to do tadabbur of the creation. I had a great teacher from Iraq, and we, we forget to make dua for the people of Iraq a lot, man. But they went through hell. And, you know, uh, we have to continue to remember people. Because those are our brothers and sisters. And, and they are also our human brothers and sisters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes in the Qur'an, He calls the believers a nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسُ doesn't say كَمَا آمَنَ mu'minun. As the believers believe, no, it says as the people believe. And if you speak Arabic here, it's Arif Lam, as the best people. Because to be a Muslim is to achieve, as we heard from Imam Dabidi Muhammad years ago, Allah yarhamu, to achieve your true human potential. So sometimes instead of calling us believers, the Quran calls us human beings. To remind us that the Iman should lead to character that shows we have reached the epitome of our humanity through the sunnah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also Imam al-Razi, he said this. So Iman is from the word which means to affirm, tasdiq. So with all of the signs around me, tasdiq al-qalb, to affirm in my heart, based on cognition, that Allah is Allah. And that's extremely important. And that's why signs are sent. And that's why in the Quran, as I was saying, we are commanded to يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ We are commanded to ponder and think deeply on the creations of the heavens and the earth. And as I was saying, I had a teacher from Iraq, listen to what he used to say. It's really beautiful. He was a great scholar, Allah Yarham. He used to say, it's an obligation for the believer to do Qira'at Al-Qur'an wa Qira'at Al-Akwan. If you speak like Arabic, it's so beautiful, right? يعني أن يقرأ القرآن ويقرأ الأكوان ويجمع بينهما that, that the person should recite the Quran and they should recite Akwan creation 
So the believer, the Muslim, is the one who's reading the Qur'an and reading the signs of the world around them and in themselves. So Iman is Tasdiq. Tasdiq in what? This is identified, of course, by the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ to affirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is nothing like him, that he is unique, he has no similarities, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to affirm our faith in the Prophet ﷺ and all of the Prophets, to affirm our faith in the hereafter. And the hereafter isn't just the day of judgment. The hereafter as soon, alhamdulillah, as we, as we die, khalas, that's our akhirah. We ask Allah to make it easy for us to affirm our belief in the angels, to affirm our belief in theodicy, that whatever happens, good or bad, is from Allah. There's no will in the universe that causes anything except the will of Allah. فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيد خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّ The Prophet said, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever has been decreed, whether good or bad, is from Allah. The Quran says, قُلْ كُلُّمْ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Say everything is from Allah. So in short, because we, most of us, we know this, but I want you to pay attention because we're about to blast off and you need to put on your seatbelt, tighten up your kufi or whatever, because you're about to go on a journey of, of a place that you may have never been before. And so you need to pay attention to this because what happens when we teach aqidah and when we teach theology, if we are infected by sort of a post-colonial hangover, which has within it a cocktail of anti-Muslim uh, bigotry and racism coupled with hatred for Muslim people, you may inadvertently, when you're teaching aqidah, be subliminally directing your hatred towards Muslims because the broader white system around you tells you that there is actually utility and value in hating Muslims, even though you would never admit it. And that's why we find Muslims, we, we find, unfortunately, people who are teaching iman that they are creating more division than unity amongst the Muslims. That, that's a problem in our pedagogy. That's a problem in how we're teaching. And I'll give you the proof. The Sahaba, Dr. Maryam, I hope you're doing good and congratulations. I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in touch with you, I promise. But Mubarak, Dr. Maryam, she, alhamdulillah, I'm very happy for her. So if we look at the Sahaba, I want everyone here to think about a critical question. The Sahaba were acutely divided. Right before Islam, they hated each other. They were enemies. وَكُنْتُمْ أَعْدَى Allah says, you were enemies to one another. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانَ And Allah united you. United you. And you became brothers and sisters. That was the case of the people around Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Before they embraced Islam, they were enemies. They embraced Islam, they learned Islam, and they loved each other. Now I want you to listen to this question critically. Most of the classes on Aqidah that we're seeing in theology, Muslims will attend those classes loving each other, but when they leave that class, they will what? They will hate Muslims more than anyone else. Hating is a whole nother discussion. So they, they, they step into Aqidah 101, whatever class they're taking, and they're, they see themselves as part of a Muslim community, the Ummah. They leave that Aqidah class and they see themselves as being in opposition to the rest of the Ummah. That, that should make us think that we're not teaching in a prophetic way. Because the Prophet ﷺ, when it came to the believers and to the broader Muslim community, he brought them together. He brought them together. He did not inflame divisions amongst the Muslims. So that means we have to really sit back now and not blame teachers and not blame imams. I'm responsible for how I react to what I'm being taught. I have a responsibility to use discernment. Uh, Aqidah means creed and, and theology, faith. So a person will come and learn faith or learn dogma, if you will, religious faith, and they will leave as a divided, fractured community Whereas in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they were divided, they learned faith, and we're talking about people who were, you know, they had serious hatred for one another. And they became brothers. They became sisters. So I want you now to pay attention to something and then I'm going to stop and take any questions that you have. 
because as I said, there are four parts to this discussion. And, and the purpose of this discussion is to strengthen the resolve of the people who are aligned on the right side of history and standing up for justice in the Muslim community and then are being pounded and constantly told for you to stand up against injustice or for you to be upset with things in the world is somehow now parallel to you not being pleased with God. That is a major mistake. And I'll just say it in Arabic and you'll understand it. As soon as I say this, is the beauty of Arabic, it'll be very clear and I'll translate it. But this is where I want you to be by next week. There is a difference between being pleased with God who decreed all things and what he decreed with. What he decreed, excuse me. Because we, we have to be pleased with God. I'm pleased with God as my Lord and my everything that happens. But what Allah has decreed, the Quran may in fact have commanded me to hate it. For example, sin. You can't just say, well, you know, it's okay. God decreed sin, so no problem. No, the Quran commands us to try to uh, call people away from sin, a sinful life with wisdom and love and caring. So I want you to appreciate there is a difference between Rida bil Qadir and Rida bil Maqdur. Rida with the Qadir with Allah, being content with Allah is unconditional. Being content with what Allah has decreed in its details is conditional. If what he has decreed aligns with his command, I'm happy. If what he has decreed is not aligned with what he's commanded, I submit to his command in the face of existential collapse because I do not submit to the world. I submit to the Lord of the worlds. And this is the edifice of what it means to be Muslim, to submit in the face of what you see, contradicting what you've been commanded, you choose the command. And if you're Sufi, you should be the one that is most invested against injustice because you understand that you are commanded to worship Allah as you see him, even though you can't see him, you know he sees you. What does it mean? It means when everything around me is evil, when everything around me is falling apart, I worship Allah as though I see him. I'm not blinded by the dunya, I'm blinded by the nur of Allah and I choose what's with Allah and I go against the dunya. That's what Ihsan is. أن تعبر الله كأنك ترى أي كأنك تراه حاكما عليك. That's what it means. It's not some Barnes and Noble hemp underwear, white people smoking hookah, quoting some bakwas rumi. That's not that's not what that is. What it means to be a sadic to Allah is to seek the path to choose His command. And that's the purpose of fiqh. Fiqh is not haram police. We shouldn't reduce Islamic law to something this shallow. Islamic law is meant to remind me what choice to make when the dunya contradicts the command. And that's why if you say the word Muslim, it means to submit. You should ask yourself what? Submit to what? To submit to Allah. What does that mean? That means to submit to Him when the world fails to align with the haqq. And I just gave you the secret to everything. So therefore, any injustice that's happening should never be used as an alibi to tap out to the dunya. Any injustice that's happening, whether it's Palestine, whether it's in, in Harlem where I used to live, whether it's in California, whether it's in Bangladesh, whether it's in Yemen, whether it's with uh, Uyghur, but wherever injustice, whether it's with the non-Muslims also, I don't use that as an excuse to submit to injustice and say, it's from Allah. I'm reminded that this is an opportunity to pass the test. And this is the test that's talked about in the Quran. Who created death and life to test you. What is the test? When that contradiction happens. And you think about it when you're younger. I remember when I became Muslim, I used to say, why is everyone a disbeliever? Why is everyone off the wrong right path? Why is everyone living a life of sin? And Shaitan came to me and he was like, you know, khalas, you, 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 everyone around you is imploding. 
So, you know, this is from Allah, so you should go ahead and just implode. No, no, the believer is the opposite. And this is why we say, And that's why the oath in Surah Al-Asr is by time, because throughout time, this contradiction will happen until Until the last day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear who is the one that runs everything. Runs everything. So before I jump off, I gave you a little segue for what to expect for next week and how we lay a true foundation for liberation theology in Islam. What I just gave you, if you're an activist or if you're an academic, in brevity, is the foundation of liberation theology within Islam. As it comes through our classically trained scholars. And I want to say something here about the classically trained scholars and the tradition. Why is the tradition, and what I'm giving you basically is from Razi. Rahimahullah. Why is the tradition important? Because the traditional Muslims were not colonized. And the Muslims of old had izza in Islam. The scholars of old, they had a certain swagger about them. They had a certain belief in the utility and agency and haqq of Islam. That they were not writing as people who were feeling that they were being pressured or defeated. They wrote as people who believed that Allah was with them. So there is a sense of, of, of izza in the, in the Torah. There is a sense of strength that will remind you. And that's why when we look at Palestinian people, we look at people in Sudan, and we look at people, the Uyghurs, we see through their eyes our spiritual ancestors who remind us of the power to be resolute and to be strong and never to be weak that's why Allah says wala tahinu wala tahzanu don't don't be depressed and don't give up and the Quran what does it say idha laqitum fi'atan fathbutu wadhkuru Allah kathira la'alakum tuflu if you meet your enemies in the battlefield be strong don't be weak that was, this these battles are th these verses are sent about jihad if you meet them in the battlefield, be firm and make dhikr. Subhanallah. Because dhikr centers this around God, centers this around Allah. So before I quit, we're talking about Iman. And I'm going to tell you something that you may never have heard before. But I want you to let it sort of, uh, you know, rest with you and, and settle with you and, and be part of your week. So that when you come next week, alhamdulillah, we're able to have an important conversation about the challenge of theodicy and pain and suffering. And I appreciate a lot of people here, mashallah, barakallahu fikum, man. And, and I want to encourage you to, to think about what I'm about to share. And also ignore like trolls, ignore weird people in the in comments box, man. Those people make dua for them. Obviously, they're very lonely, man. Go make some coffee, bro. You know, like, don't don't respond with abuse because people that are taking the time out of their day, Dr. Miriam can chime in on this, people that have enough time in their day to come into some chat or some live and start hating on people, those are broken people, man. Those are people that are alone, right? They're hurting. We pray for their healing. Alhamdulillah. Oh, I got four kids. You don't know. Coffee at this hour? I got four ones. I got two little babies that in the next hour are going to be like, Baba, let's pray to Hajjud. Baba, at two o'clock in the morning. And welcome, we welcome you, Riyadh, to the to the set. And again, this is open for everybody, Muslims, non-Muslims, whoever. You know, it's not that kind of crowd. My, folks that kind of roll with me, they tend to be lovers, man, not haters. Alhamdulillah. So, Iman is often translated, and I want you to pay attention to this. Iman is often translated as faith in God. And this is going to be important in offering a cadence and helping us sort of uh, animate our discussion for next week. Blame the label, what's up, baby? See you, man. Number one is when you go to Sunday school or you take um, classes, say, as a young person, you hear the word Iman in God, faith in God, faith in Allah, faith in the Prophet. Faith in the angels. But that's not what it means. And the reason that's very important is because 
words have meanings. And, and, and Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, rahimahullah, he said that when you understand words, you change your attitudes. And when you change your attitudes, you change your actions. You know? So it's very important. And I want those who are asking about Khilafat and Umayyad and this in the comments box. Hey man, listen to the lecture. Pay attention. Shaitan got you busy with something else. You know, if you were in front of me, you wouldn't do that. If I was in front of you, I wouldn't do that. So I like to tell people when you attend lives on Instagram, act like you would if you were in front of the people. And try to listen and pay attention because what I'm about to share with you, I think is very important and very transformative. And it will bring us together, alhamdulillah. But I love your passion. And that is that often through Sunday school and through uh, you know our training as young Muslims and, and teenagers, we're told faith in God. Faith in God. Faith in the angels. Faith in this. Faith in that. Faith in that. But the word ba doesn't mean in. The word ba means with. So if I say in Arabic, Jittu bi amrin. I came with amr. Amani, I'm going to get to you. May Allah bless you with good health. I promise I will share dua soon. I see you. I have a sister who's asking about, you know, make dua for good health. First, we pray for her. Everyone say, Amin. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her a great shifa or whoever she's worried about needing healing. May Allah heal them. So let me focus, folks. So the word Iman is tasdiq, but the word B doesn't mean in. And this is very important if you, as we expand next week our discussion that when you say faith in God you're limiting the meeting it actually means faith with God it's an alaqa it's sohbah it, it's a relationship if you say faith in something in, in, in our understanding in Islamic theology we understand that to be the acquisition of axiomatic principles and rules that teach you theology that's in that's in so that means that Islam, if we say it's in, it frames theology as simply a cognitive exercise. So I've learned Iman. And no doubt, that's important. But when I say with, that implies a whole other ballgame. And that's why in Arabic we say, Jitu bi Amrin, I came with Amr, not in Amr. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Something really beautiful. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Welcome new convert. Hey, I've been in your shoes. If I say anything you don't understand, put me in check. Okay, Enzo, I got you. So the verse says, those who believe, it's translated if you look at it, those who believe in the unseen. But Al-Qadi Abu Bakr. Al-Maliki, he says that this ba, listen in Arabic what it's called. Musahaba. Ba, musahaba. What does musahaba mean in English? Companionship. From the same word as sahabi. The same word as sahabi. The sahaba of the Prophet. Rudwanullah alayhim. Sahaba. So, I believe with Allah... In the sense of I have this relationship, this companionship with my Iman. It's not just in. It's with my being. And we talk about the idea of mindfulness, the idea of presence, the idea of putting ourselves into, uh, pushing into a situation. The Quran says you must push into Islam completely. So instead of saying... Robert, I invite you to embrace Islam right now. We got Robert Benjamin. He said, ask me to embrace Islam. Hey, I'm, I'm inviting you right now. Welcome, man. Don't delay the goodness, bro. Jump in. MashaAllah. So what does it mean? As I finish quickly, sorry. Iman with Allah implies not only learning and not only feeling, but a choice. A choice. So the choices that I make are going to be indicative of the strength of that relationship. Musahaba. I am the sahib of Iman and Iman is the sahib of me. And if you think about what I just said 
as far as Allah says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Quran says very beautifully, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are thankful to me, I will increase you. This reciprocal relationship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Remember, you know, remember me, I will remember you. So now let's, let's take it a, a step back quickly. And then next week we'll continue. If we say that Iman is to believe with Allah, with the angels, with the messengers, with the books, with the hereafter, and with the decree, what that implies is when that withness runs into contradictions, I choose what's with Allah. I choose what's with Allah. I choose what's with Allah. And let me give you some examples and we'll stop. Of course, it doesn't mean we're with Allah physically. Allah is beyond creation. He's not part of creation or in creation. We know that as Muslims, alhamdulillah, rabbil alami. No need to talk about hulul and all that weird stuff. Allah is transcendent. But being with Allah means that if I'm all alone and I have the opportunity to do evil, I realize that I'm with Allah. I choose what's with Allah. I choose what's with Allah. Maybe I'm with some friends. Maybe I'm at work. Maybe I'm with some people and there's no Muslims or nobody around me. And I remember, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ Allah is with you wherever you are. بِعِلْمِهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى Number two, how do I live with the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How do I live with the Prophet? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is that I choose his sunnah and I choose his teachings and I follow the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Much love to the brothers on the inside, man. I used to go and actually teach brothers uh, in, 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 you know, who are part of the carceral state. And Alhamdulillah, it was, I learned so much from them, man. You know, the brothers that were there on the inside, a uh, brother from just came out of prison recently saying, Alhamdulillah, I used to benefit, mashallah. So how do I believe with the Messenger of Allah? Is I choose what the Prophet taught me. How do I believe with the angels? I'm never alone. The angels are with me. And if you understand what I'm about to say, you understand what I'm teaching these people. We're learning the haqiqah. Now what we're learning is the haqiqah. This is the haqiqah imani ihsaniyah. How do, I, how do I live a life to worship Allah as though I see Him, even though I don't see Him, I know He sees me? Is to frame my relationship of Iman as companionship. Is to frame my relationship with uh, Iman as companionship. Here's a question I can give an example. Someone said, can all my sins be forgiven? In my relationship with Allah, I know that Allah says, whoever believes and repents to him, satajiduhu tawab rahima In this relationship, unique relationship between you and Allah, Allah will forgive you. That's why we said yesterday, mashallah, the majority of Ahl Sunnah, Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, wa Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi, and others, they say that any believer who truly repents to Allah is forgiven. This is the strong majority opinion of Muslim Sunni theologians in particular. How do I, how do I live with the Quran? Is the Quran is my guide. I live my life according to Quranic teachings. I align my life with Quran. So now I'm with Quran. Now you can appreciate why Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said what about Sayyidah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Kan al-Qur'anu yamshi. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a walking Quran. Why? Because he lives with the Quran, embodying the Quran sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why there were some Sahabi it took them more than 50 to 40 years to finish the Qur'an. And in fact, uh, Khatib al-Baghdadi, rahimahullah, he says about the Sahabi, he said that there was a Sahabi who finished the Qur'an. He lived in Iraq. And he was so happy, he was euphoric. And people ask him, you finished the Qur'an, but that was so many decades ago. He said, no, no. I khatamtuhu bil a'mal. Ma khatamtuhu bil aqwal min zaman. 
لكن اليوم ختمته بالأعمال يا الله he said no no I finished reading it decades ago but today I finished acting on every command and order in the Quran we nowadays we think about ختم القرآن just reciting it the Sahaba ورضوان الله عليهم that made ختم of Quran with their actions سبحان الله why because with the Quran with the Akhirah, what does it mean to have Iman with the Akhirah? The choices I make, am I making a choice that is going to impact my Akhirah in the right way or the wrong way? For example, injustice. The Prophet Wasallam said in a sound hadith related by Imam Abu Dawood, that there'll be a person who's so punished in the grave, he will actually, he will actually grab the Malaika and say, why are you punishing me like this? And they will say, you passed marabtu bin madhlum wa lam tansurhu. You passed by oppression and you didn't stop it. You didn't act on your withness of Iman in the hereafter. The hadith of Sayyidina al-Bukhari, that oppression will be oppression in the hereafter. So when I say I live with the hereafter, what kind of choices I make when I go out on Friday night? What kind of choices I make? When I go out on Saturday night, what kind of choices I make? When I'm hanging out with my friends, what kind of choices do I make? At work, when I'm doing business, what kind of choices do I make? Am I making choices that are aligned with success in the hereafter? Or am I making choices that align with someone that may suffer in the hereafter? That is what it means to bil akhirah. Wa bil akhiratihum yuqinun. Is very important. That's why one of the great scholars said, whoever lives like, who, uh, whoever will experience Jannah, live like a person of Jannah in dunya. And finally, is Iman with what Allah has decreed, the good and the bad, and we're going to talk about that next week. What do we talk about briefly today? We went over what we're going to talk about in two sessions tonight. We introduced the idea of Iman. Uh, Sheikh Al-Laqani says in Jawhara, وَفُصِّرَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالتَّصْدِيقَةِ وَنُطْقُ فِيهِ خَلْفٌ وَنُطْقُ فِيهِ خَلْفٌ بِالتَّرِيقَةِ I can't remember, but he says, وَفُصِّرَ وَفُصِّرَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالتَّصْدِيقِ You know that Iman is to have faith in your heart. That's Iman. Then we talked about our understanding of Iman is not in, is with. To be with our faith, to make the right choices. Then we talked about the idea of Ihsan and how that lays the foundation for activism and liberation theology and how we stay resilient with suffering. We don't surrender to the suffering, we surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll stop now. If you have any questions, mashallah, it's a lot of people here, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, on TikTok as well as Instagram. If you have any questions about the topic, uh, we'll be happy to take them. Can you make dua for our youth? Uh, Huda Khalifa, she just passed away. Allahumma ghfir laha warhamma. We had a, an amazing sister, Huda Khalifa, who died of leukemia. leukemia. Inshallah, she will be a shaheed according to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah accept her and raise her status and forgive her. Ya Rabbal Alameen. MashaAllah. If a Muslim is afraid of an abuser with a dysregulated, ner dysregulated nervous system and suicidal doesn't mean they are lacking faith. No. And this is something that we'll talk about if we have time in our seminar over the winter retreat. And that is that mental health challenges and emotional health challenges have nothing to do with our Iman. Those are tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like people may have other type of physical challenges or tests. No one says to someone that has weak vision, they have weak vision or they have problems in their vision or they have problems focusing because they have weak Iman. This is one of the gravest, most irresponsible things I've ever heard said to people. And also it actually inflames if they're having uh, you know, uh, um, issues like compulsion, if they're struggling with issues like depression, to tell them that all of this is because they have weak Iman just makes their Iman more weak. So it's the opposite. The best du'a Imran for uh, removing sickness is the du'a of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who used to say, أَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الْعَظِيمُ رَبَّ الْعَرْشَ الْكَرِيمُ أَنْ يَشْفِيكِ We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to cure you. The, the Lord of the, the transcendent Lord of the Arsh to cure you. And also the Prophet used to say, لَا بَأْسْ 
right? Look how the Prophet make dua for people say, these duas are so simple for sick people. Yeah, because sick people, maybe they're tired. You give them like a long dua to say, it's hard for them. But subhanAllah, you, 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 you have to think about the mercy of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Exactly. Mental health is from trauma. Mental health is from a host of things, but not because of weak iman. And in fact, what happens when we do this, when we, we tell people you are having these feelings and these thoughts and these ideations because your iman, we're actually giving the, the subject of the trauma a green light. Whereas the person that has inflicted trauma in that way on a person should be held accountable. It's like breaking the law or you know something which is illegal. They should be held. But in that idea, with that way of thinking, you're, you're giving the, the, the one who is the subject of the trauma a green light and you're putting the blame on the object of the trauma. What the Zionists are doing now with Palestinian brothers and sisters. They dehumanize them. And they degrade them to the point that they think that allows them to treat them as people, that, that they're not people. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim. We'll talk about this, the idea of accountability in the future. I sometimes think that sin can be excused and I struggle to think of anyone who truly deserves hell. Yeah, Sam, this is a good question. And, and we have to, re I'll repeat it inshallah. Someone can also type it for her. The dua, As'arullah al-azim, Rabb al-arsh al-kareem, and yashfiq. You know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord, the transcendent Lord, to cure you. Uh, the other question someone's asking on TikTok is sometimes they have trouble believing how can people go to hell forever. This is a very important question that touches even into the idea of um, redemption within Islamic social justice or Islamic human justice movements. And that is that, of course, we believe redemption is open to everybody. But after somebody dies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will not be judged in a good way or a bad way. In a, a, they will not be wronged. Allah will not oppress or wrong anyone in the hereafter. So when they are judged, they are judged by absolute justice. And that's what it means to trust Allah. I trust Allah more than I trust my own. You know, how could this happen? I leave it to Allah. Next lecture, every, every, every Wednesday, Hamza at like 10. Uh, 11 p.m. Eastern Time, inshallah. If Robert, if you can DM me, unfortunately, it's good because there's a lot of questions and I'm tr tr struggling to keep up with you. But one thing, just some advice for you as someone who's seeking, be patient with people, man. People are teaching. There's a lot of questions, right? Let's not make it sort of centered on just our moment. You're here with a lot of people, so be patient, bro. We will take care of you. We'll get to you, inshallah. Thank you for writing it. As'arullah al-Azim, Rabb al-Arsh al-Kareem, and Yashfiq. If someone can write the English for her too, like the transliteration, that will be super amazing. I didn't see your question. We'll take a few more questions related to the actual subject. And if not, we do actually, from time to time, open questions as well. Alhamdulillah. But what do we talk about today? The idea of faith. وَفُسِرَ الْإِمَانُ بِتَسْدِيقِ Right? That Iman is understood to be an affirmation of the heart. And then we talked about what we believe in as Muslims. And then we talked about the idea of belief with, not belief in. And then we talked briefly about a framework that we're going to address and unpack next week for dealing with existential crises, injustice, sin, problems of the world, evil, pain, sickness, and suffering. All that we'll tackle next week. And then a few weeks after that, we have our winter retreat at my school, which will be free to everybody uh, and we will give also even the text out that people can use. Jazakum Allah khairan. Uh, your son is 13. He wants to join my classes online. The classes are going to start the week of January 16th uh, for youth. If he goes to uh, join, uh, if he goes to SuhaibWeb.com, he can join there. SuhaibWeb.com. And it's for your whole family. So $9.99 a month for the whole family. Alhamdulillah. Sarah, I'm sorry I keep seeing you, but I'm not seeing uh, your question, so my my apology. Dua for mental health. It's a beautiful dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from anxiety and stress. Wa alaykum salam, Ali Khan. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from things that bother me about the past. Barakallahu feek and things that worry me about the future.
It's like such a beautiful dua. And Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, he said the Prophet sallallahu would say this dua whenever he felt nervous or some anxiety or any stress. It's no problem, Carla. You don't have to know Arabic. It's all good. Don't worry. We're all here for you. Alhamdulillah. Welcome. Like feel feel very comfortable and part part of the community here. And everyone's very happy, I'm sure, to see you. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumallah khairan. We end uh, when Drexel invites me, you know, the yearly Drexel... <laughs> The yearly Drexel invite, right? We have to make it happen. Barakallahu feekum, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you and bless you. And we will see all of you next week. And we do have like an open Q&A, usually on Sunday evening. So we'll try to see all of you there and get to your questions. Robert, again, reach out to me. I'm going to take care of you. We end by making a special dua for all the Muslims, especially this young generation of Generation Z, holding it down, you know, unapologetically out there demanding justice. We ask Allah to bless you, to increase you. We're very proud of you, proud of your parents, mashallah. Um, we pray also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will alleviate the suffering of the people in Palestine. And we pray that Allah will, will wake the ummah up and humanity up. There is a genocide happening. There is a, a, a live slaughter happening that we're watching, subhanAllah. And the world is 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 in ignoring Palestine, ignoring Sudan, ignoring the Uyghurs, ignoring you. You can think of, unfortunately, too many people to list who are being ignored by a world that tends not to encourage people towards kindness. And so we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and nas wa yuthabitum al haq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate the challenges and pain and suffering of people in Palestine. We ask Allah to bless those who died to accept them as shuhada, to unite them with their children under the babysitting of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. We pray for our brothers and sisters in India. Pay attention to what is going on in India legally in Kashmir under the Modi regime. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who obey Him. We ask Allah to allow us to use this moment as a means to come back to Him. We ask Allah to accept us and to forgive us. Ya Allah, khud bi aidina ya Rabbana. We ask Allah to take us by our hands and guide us and keep us on the haqq. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum wa khairan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.